So welcome to uh, lecture four of How the Bible Became the Bible by Rabbi Lawrence Troster of uh, Kesher Israel Congregation in Westchester, Pennsylvania. Uh, tonight we're going to discuss the can uh, canonization of the Torah um, through the documentary hypothesis and specifically look at two of the main sources for the Torah, the P and the D schools. We may not get everything done tonight, but that's, we'll, we'll move in that direction. So if you take a look at the first page of the material I've given you, um, there's a really good essay in uh, the Chumash Eitz Chaim on the documentary hypothesis by Rabbi Benjamin Skolnick, who's uh, uh, he and I overlapped in rabbinical school. And um, he summarizes the essential, uh, the, the essential uh, definition of what's called the documentary hypothesis, which was developed in the 19th century by a German uh, Protestant Bible scholar named Wellhausen. And um, so he calls it here four literary complexes, and they are referred to as J, E, P, and D. Um, now, J is because the yud heh vav heh U seems to use the name, and in German that starts with a J. And um, supposedly, again, the, the, a lot of this, there's been a lot of adjustment of this theory, but the assumption is the J tradition is, was written in the 10th century BCE, and it's from Judea, from the southern kingdom of Judea. The Eloistic source called E is named because of the use of the divine name Elohim a lot, and seems to come from the north, written around 900 to 800 BCE, and it is often parallel to um, J and E. The thing that has happened in the last uh, couple of decades is that some scholars believe it's really impossible to disentangle the J from the E, and they are often now referring to the J-E source, okay? Um, the priestly source, which is called P, uses the divine name El Shaddai and then other divine names, and has a lot of ritual texts, and there's a lot of disagreement about the dating of uh, P. Uh, some, uh, some say it's as early as J and E, others posit a date as late as the Babylonian exile. In fact, within P there are layers um, that we can date um, probably uh, the oldest layer to the 8th century BCE. So anyway, that's P. The Deuteronomic source is called D, and it's considered to have been written later than J and E, uh, from the 8th to the 6th century BCE. And um, the point is, it's a very different source, and it is composed of the book of Deuteronomy. And that's why Deuteronomy seems so different from the other four books, which are combinations of J, E, uh, e and P. Um, and uh, Sometimes it appears there's totally new stuff. Sometimes they're commenting on earlier material found in E. Um, but also, um, the same group that created the Deuteronomic, and I'm using the word school, uh, advisor, also were responsible for editing the final edition of the books of Joshua, Judges, Samuels, and Kings. And they utilized a lot of earlier material, stories, legends, but also archival material from the royal courts of Judea and, <coughs> and, um, uh, and in northern Israel. Um, and you can tell when their editorial hand um, is found. Uh, it's, not, it's pretty easy to find. Yes, Stu? Uh, many works of literature, and Shakespeare is uh, the best example, have been... Uh, analyzed with uh, rigorous statistical analysis and yeah. identify different authors. Has that been uh, tried with the Bible? Or? Well, you have to understand, for over a hundred years, scholars have been looking at the, the, the texts, and, and I'm going to tell you what the proofs are for the documentary hypothesis. Statistical analysis? Not statistical analysis, uh, per se, um, but you'll see. There's a whole variety of ways in which um, this can be shown that the general theory is correct. The individual, sometimes it's hard to know what texts are J and what texts are E. Um, it's not so easy sometimes because there is at least one level and probably more than one level of what's called 
redaction or editing. In other words, the um, very likely it was people from the P school who edited together the first four books of the Torah, uh, utilizing the different sources, and they were the ones who probably also edited, uh, added on Deuteronomy, um, and uh, again, somewhere between 600 and 400 BCE. In other words, we uh, probably the editing or redaction process, and the redactor is often called R, um, uh, started in the Babylonian exile, but a lot of scholars feel that the final form took place um, after the Babylonian exile in the Persian Empire. Um, and uh, there, but again, that's one of the hardest things to know is exactly how it got edited because we don't have minutes of the meetings. Uh, and, and when it happened and where it happened is, is a really difficult thing. And this is the whole, uh, some scholars look at nothing more than what's called the redaction history. How was it edited? So you have source criticism. This is called, when you look at modern Bible scholarship, it's broadly into two different trends. There's what's called lower criticism. That's the manuscripts, looking at the different manuscripts, the ancient translations, and trying to find what the original text was. Okay, that's called lower criticism, and we've been doing sort of that. Higher criticism is attempting to understand where, what were the sources, the original sources, that's source criticism, and how did it get edited together? That's redactional criticism, okay? And, and so all of that, it shows you that, and this is, as I said, this has been going on for more than 100 years. Uh, it started off as a German Protestant effort, um, and uh, one of the problems with their early efforts is that German Protestants were anti-Catholic and anti-Semitic <laughs> in many cases, and, um, as a result, they were they Valhaus intended to he didn't like ritual because he was a Protestant, um, so he tended to denigrate the priestly rituals as being foreign intrusions and uh, so it's not that these things have been without bias and as a result, uh, Jewish Bible scholars uh, really didn't emerge until the twenties um, um, and thirties. Um, uh, and uh, since then, you have Jewish Bible scholars who were in, in this endeavor, and Catholics eventually also got involved. But um, uh, it's not something that the, the Jewish community got involved in early on because they saw this as an attack on the holiness of the Torah. Uh, Solomon Schechter, who created the conservative movement, uh, referred to it as the higher anti-Semitism. <laughs> yes. Where did the name criticism uh, it has such a negative connotation. Well, it's it's um, it's like a literary criticism. In other words, it's it, it doesn't it, it's you know they're literary critics of Shakespeare and so on. It doesn't mean criticize. It means to analyze. And the tools of biblical criticism were derived originally from um, uh, analytical criticism of ancient Greek source texts. They utilized the same tools. But the very first person to really apply it to the Bible was Spinoza in the 17th century. I mean, if we use the word analysis as opposed to criticism... Um... You, you, you may do that if you wish. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Um, how do we know that this took place? Is there any evidence within the Bible itself that this took place? And there is. So, for example, if you, and here you're going to have to turn pages, um, if you take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 29, uh, verse 20, Deuteronomy is very obvious, and you, some people may have to share, um, is very obviously a very different book than the other books uh, of the Torah in its style, and its language. Um, so if you look again at, at chapter 29, verse 20, um, here at the end of the verse it says, in accordance with all the sanctions of the covenant recorded in this book of teaching. In Hebrew, Besefer HaTorah Hazeh. Now, when it says that, it's not referring to the Torah the way we understand it, but rather the book of Deuteronomy. And that's what the book of Deuteronomy, nowhere, the book of Deuteronomy calls itself Sefer HaTorah, okay? And, um, and there are several references to this. 
And if you go, for example, to the book of Joshua, chapter 8, verse 31, it says, um, this is on page 473, um, there is in, in Parshat um, Kitavo, um, there's a description of this ceremony there's, that the Israelites are supposed to do when they enter the land of Israel, uh, how they're supposed to go on to the two mountains near what is now Nablus today and do this whole cursing and blessing ceremony that's part of the Deuteronomic tradition. It's not in the other texts of the Torah. Um, and it talks about how, they, uh, how Joshua did it. And it says, as is written in the book of the teaching of Moses. And referring to the book of Deuteronomy as the teaching of Moses, the, Tor, uh, the Torah Moshe is also a characteristic of the way Deuteronomy is portrayed. Okay. Um, another example of this, um, if you go to 1 Kings chapter 2, uh, verse 3. 709. Um, this is uh, uh, just before King David dies, he calls Solomon and he gives Solomon this kind of final testament. And a scholar, if you, if you read through the chapter, you will see that the, up down to the end of verse 4, it sounds like Deuteronomy. Okay, And the editor, the Deuteronomic historians, added this on to make David look better, because if you read on, basically David tells Solomon, you've got to kill these people who did me wrong. In other words, sounding like a, uh, the head of a mafia clan. So they can't have David like that, because so what they do is, uh, he says uh, in verse 3, Keep the charge of the Lord your God, walking in his ways and following his laws, his commandments, rules, admonitions, as recorded in the teaching of Moses. And look what it says. Uh, um, if your descendants are scrupulous in their conduct and walk before me faithfully with all their heart and soul, your uh, line on the throne of Israel uh, shall be, um, uh, shall never end. Okay? So, um, so that's Deuteronomic language. Okay? So, um, how do, so when did this happen that this, well, oh, there's one other important uh, text I want to show you, 2 Kings 14. Uh, verse 6. This is on page uh, 809. Um, this is talking about King uh, Joash of Judah. And it says, He did not put to death the children of the assassins in accordance with what is written in the book of the teachings of Moses, where the Lord commanded parents shall not be put to death for children, nor children to death for parents. A person shall be put to death only for his own crime. All right, so he is in effect quoting Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 16. Now, we will, when we get to looking at D more closely, we'll actually show how the proof that's found in uh, the story uh, in, in the book of Kings, Second Kings, of how Deuteronomy actually was found, so to speak, or promulgated. Okay, we, um, we know that the P, J, and E was probably a separate collection that was then added to D. Now, when did this happen? Um, I think I mentioned to you that the, the earliest thing that we can point to um, that shows the canonization of the Torah is found in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 8. And that's found on page 1873. Uh, yes, Stuart, you had a question? Deuteronomy is considered just generally a recapitulation of the rest of the code. But it's not. It's not just a recapitulation. There's a lot of material in there that's not found anywhere else. Okay? Um, so this describes a ceremony on uh, 
the, in the seventh month, and they, Ezra comes to bring the scroll of the teachings of Moses with which the Lord had charged Israel. And on Rosh Hashanah, what we call Rosh Hashanah, the first day of the seventh month, it's not called that then, they gather everybody together and they start reading it. And when they read it, um, if you uh, take a look uh, on the next page in 1874, it says, they found written in the teaching, this is verse 14, that the Lord had commanded Moses that the Israelites must dwell in booths during the festival of the seventh month. And so they get like, oh my God, we haven't been doing this. And they go out and they take the four species mentioned in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 40, and they build sukkahs out of them. The idea of having a lulav and etrog hadn't developed yet. They thought that the commandment was to build their sukkah out of these four things. And that's what happens. So it's evident that Leviticus is part of this. Okay? And there's some other texts here that I've quoted you as well that show that there was a point where all this material came together in a single document. And we know that this, we can date this ceremony to 444 BCE, during the Persian Empire. Okay? And it, as I mentioned once before, it could be that it was the influence of the Persians that, um, that kind of created this process of canonizing all this uh, material. Because the Persians wanted local, all the ethnic groups uh, in their empire to live according to their own ancestral laws. And, and this goes back to the idea that um, when you have a legal system, there is the living part of the legal system, the day-to-day -day thing, right, where you have judges and you have sages and so on. And every once in a while, you have a consolidation of all of this into a law code. And you can see this in later Jewish history with the Mishnah, with the Mishnah Torah, with the Shulchan Orach, um, and, 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 and this happens. So there was all this law from various sources and customs and things, and it got consolidated into one single document, which they then become what we know as the Torah, and it is canonized, it is then become sacred, the text becomes sacred. Yes, Dan? So who was on the committee that did this? <laughs> um, it's very likely uh, uh, priests, it's very likely the priests, because uh, they were the only ones who, um, who were literate, uh, or not even all of them. In other words, uh, well, not just the priests, but also people we call um, the scribes, who represent the wisdom tradition. The, the professional scribes who worked in the court, in the, gov the government bureaucrats, okay? Um, so that's pro that's a guess, but it's a pretty good guess. Okay. Yeah. Okay. This is a long process. I mean, it goes through hundreds of years. Yes. Okay. We get to the point of the canonization. That was when. Uh, well, the canonization, as I said, the earliest one we can definitely point to is 444 BCE. Okay. It gets canonized. Yeah. And then how come after that is no more? I don't know. Well, it's accepted so much. Be, okay, well, because it's accepted as this is the text of Moses, and so you can't add to it. And then eventually the prophetic texts got canonized, and then the later writings. Right? It, it's it is a long process. It yeah, goes over hundreds of years. To, to change no, no, no. Well, I, I mentioned last time that there were there were there are texts which seem to claim to be as legitimate as the Torah, what the temple scroll that's found in the Dead Sea Scrolls um, appears to be a kind of counter Torah or a, 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 a something that is, I don't know, it's more, it's not a commentary on the Torah, it's almost as if it's meant to replace the Torah. So there were groups that had texts that they consider sacred, and we don't know who wrote the temple scroll, um, that had different ideas, but they did not form the majority of the community and their texts were lost to history, okay? So if you wanna see the diagram, uh, if you turn to page two, you will see um, 
the relationship between the different sources. The, you know, I mean, this is a simple, simple diagram, um, and you know, it, it sort of does it. So J and E are the oldest sources. They get edited together somewhere to form J E. Okay, and out of J E um, comes the original draft. I mean, the same around the same period of time comes the original draft of Deuteronomy, that's DTR1. Um, also, you have P. Now, again, some people feel that, you know, this is sim simple in the sense that P actually, there's material in P that's as old as J and E, um, and uh, that P um, has its own history of evolution, and it's in at least two distinct parts, an earlier and a later part. But what happens is, is that the P school takes J and E and creates it into a four book Torah. Okay? Then what happens is, is that you have an evolution of the D material, which includes another sort of tradition, DTR2, and it becomes D. And D is most of De the book of Deuteronomy. There's the final edition of Deuteronomy by the P people, they added a little bit at the end, okay? But the point is then you have D. And the R are the redactors, the editors of all this material, and you can see it happens at various times. So then this all gets redacted together, possibly through several layers of editing, and becomes what we call now the Torah, and out of the D comes the DH, which is the Deuteronomic history, meaning Judges, Samuels, um, uh, and Kings. Joshua, Judges, Samuels, and Kings. Yes, Eileen. Because Joshua, Judges, etc., is really part of the D um, school? Well, they did the final editing, but a lot of the material is much older than that. Why did they stop at Deuteronomy with the Torah? Why isn't, for example, Joshua part of it? Or, you know, we're saying, why was it cut off there? Why wasn't it cut off after four books? Because when you look at um, Joshua, Judges, Samuels, and Kings, they're really history books. So, and when you think about it, the Torah goes from the creation of the world to the point where the Israelites are going to enter the land. Right. And, but the, the, the vast, a large part of the Torah are the law codes. And that's what's important about the Torah, are the law codes found in Exodus, found in Leviticus, found in Deuteronomy, and also a lot of laws and numbers. And so it's seen as a code, a consolidated code of the Israelite tradition. Okay? Yes, Dan? Well, there are some that think that Joshua should be part of a six-volume uh, Torah. Uh, in the book, The Hidden Story of the Bible, they carry this out and, and trace this story through Joshua, actually through Kings. But there's no, there's no um, leak, real legal material in those books. There's no reason, if you've got a law code, why it needs to go that. It's like saying um, the Federalist Papers should be part of the Constitution. Do you know what I mean? It's like saying... The Emancipation Proclamation should be incorporated into the Constitution. There comes a point where you say, this is it. This is the document. And yes, we have ways of amending, which we don't, you don't do that with the Torah in precisely the same way. But there has to come to an end where you say, this is the document. Right? Yes, Alan. In this chart, where is DTR2? Uh, DTR2 is, and you'll see um, that... In Deuteronomy, it's evident that the book itself goes through at least two major editing. There's an earlier layer, the original layer, and then there's a secondary layer. In addition to which, Deuteronomy use, uh, quotes a few sources that are much earlier than Deuteronomy. So it, it's, mo you know, like I can, you know, there's a couple of chapters, there's several chapters in Deuteronomy that are way older than Deuteronomy. Like... Moses, the Hazinu, Parshat, uh, the poem Hazinu that Moses says before he dies, that wasn't written by D. They just decided to use it. But it's the same thing true with E, by the way. The Ten Commandments is in the E document, but precedes it. And we don't know where it came from. So, so 
Yes, Bert. Regard J and A J is, I guess, ostensibly the oldest. Uh, J and E are the oldest. But it looks like they're separate. They, they, they are separate. There, there is, is. Somebody wrote the J, and then somebody else came along and wrote the E. And were they separate and distinct stories? Yes. Someone then got together and said, hey, these stories are really similar. Uh, so why don't we put them together? Pretty much. In other words, the J is from Judea, um, possibly from the time of Solomon. The E is from the Northern Kingdom. And the P people eventually incorporated both of them together with their version of things. Now, when you look, as you will see, when you look through um, the, the narrative parts of the Torah, you can take the J narrative and you can take the P narrative and they are, can be pulled out separately and you can have a nice uh, narrative. You don't need the others. Of course, you lose a bunch of stuff. The E is not as complete. But as you'll see, you can read, you, you could read just the J narrative. It would start with chapter two of Genesis and read it right through. You'd have a different version of Genesis. Would it be a, a possibility or likelihood that a lot of this is probably based upon oral storytelling? Originally, yes. Yeah, so originally, it was some, undoubtedly it was oral. And then they started writing it down. Yes. So there, were, there were storytellers in the... Yes. Because people were traveling back and forth, their stories had to be somewhat similar. So well, again, what prompts them to start pulling this stuff together could be times of national uncertainty where they want to preserve these things. I mean, one of the things that P is very good at is it evidently wanted, the P people wanted to preserve all these different voices. And you're right, originally, I mean, we know there were bards, uh, you know, who that would travel around and sing, you know, epic tales of the past. That's how this stuff evolved. Yeah, I mean. So if they're preserving all the voices, were they not bothered by the inconsistencies or the conflicts? The no, that's the interesting thing. It's a very ancient Jewish idea that you record the dissenting voice. And, and sometimes they clean it up a bit, okay? they No, seriously, sometimes they smooth it over a bit, and that's why when you read it today, it's, does, it sounds like a, just an ongoing narrative. You really got to start digging into it to pick it apart to see that. Sometimes it's a little more obvious where you have repetitions of the same story. Or sometimes it's two animals. Yeah, exactly. Well, exactly. There's two versions of the flood story that got edited together, okay? And one is P, and uh, the other one's... J, I think. Yes. I have a question. You mentioned the DTR2. Yeah. It's a newer version and was found that they had a previous version. That, that well, what happened is, as you will see in um, 2 Kings 22, there's a story about how a scroll was found in the temple, and we think it was Deuteronomy. Which version of Deuteronomy? We're not sure. It may have been DTR1. Okay. My question is, are they were different? They were big differences there? Or just no, that you can, but you can, uh, scholars can actually parse it out and show, you know, this is earlier and this is later. And part of it has to do with language. But it's the same story. The same. Uh, no, it adds on stuff. <laughs> it adds on stuff. Okay. So, um, so here, so let's go to 2 Kings chapter 22. Um, this is a, a very important. A uh, piece of evidence for the redaction of the Torah, <coughs> meaning the editing of it together. Okay. Um, okay. So um, this is the story of King Josiah. Okay. Uh, this is on page eight thirty one. He's one of the last kings of Judea. And he, uh, he ascends the throne when he's only eight years old because there's a whole story about a coup and everything that's going on. Anyway, he is one of the few people that the Deuteronomic historian thinks was a good king. He did what was pleasing to the Lord and he followed all the ways of his ancestors. 
David, he did not deviate to the right and left. I mean, if you go back, you know, the, 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 the editors of Kings will tell you this guy was lousy and this guy was lousy. They hardly like anybody uh, among the kings of Israel or Judea, but they liked Josiah because what happened? It talks about um, the fact that the temple had to be renovated. Okay, and the workmen are, you know, fixing it up. And look at verse 8. The high priest was a guy named Hilkiah. He says, I have found a scroll of the teaching. Say, all right. And he, he, he says this to a scribe, which is sort of the chief bureaucrat in Josiah's administration, a guy named Shaphan. And Hilkiah gave the scroll to Shaphan, who read it. The scribe Shaphan then went to the king and reported to the king, okay? And he tells them that they found this thing, and so then they read it to the king, and the king freaks out. This is on the next page, verse 11. He rent his clothes, okay? And he is essentially saying, oh my God, we're in big trouble. So we'd better go find a prophet to find out exactly how bad things are. And they go find a prophetess named Hulda. And she basically says, yeah, the kingdom's going to get destroyed, but not in your lifetime. All right. So what Josiah does is, and this is in the next chapter, he convenes everybody together. Like, again, this is like a renewal of Mount Sinai. And they read the text. And everybody get, you know, um, the people say, yes, we're going to reaffirm the covenant. And when you look at what Josiah does in, the, in, in, in chapter 23, he's basically following Deuteronomy. In other words, one of the key characteristics of the Deuteronomic school is that there should only be one temple in Jerusalem. Okay? When you look in the book of Exodus, it doesn't say there's only to be one place. It says wherever you decide to sacrifice with God, this is what the altar should be. And throughout Israelite history, uh, in the north and in the south, there were shrines and temples all over the land. And the Temple of Solomon was really a, started life as a royal chapel. Okay? There were high, what they called high places. There were temples. We have, we found ruins of this stuff. There was, before the temple in Jerusalem, there was a temple in a place called Shiloh that the Philistines destroyed. Okay? Um, they found a perfectly good Judean temple in the town of Arad, um, which, you know, in miniature was looked like the Jerusalem temple. So what does Deuteronomy say? You can't do that. You should only in, go in one place. So not only should you shut down all the pagan shrines, you should shut down all the other ones as well. And one of the things that the Deuteronomic historian doesn't like about many of the kings is that he didn't do that. Okay? That's why they condemn them. They may have been a good king in other ways, but he didn't shut down the local shrines. So... Josiah does that. He shuts down all the local scribes. And in fact, the temple of Arad was destroyed at the time of Josiah. And all the local, the priests from all the different places around the country, he brings them into Jerusalem. And he cleans out the temple from any pagan stuff that came from his, from his uh, previous kings, because there had been some pagan practices going on. He does a revolution, a religious revolution. And this is often referred to as the Deuteronomic revolution. And it's because of Deuteronomy that, with a few minor exceptions, there are only one temple from that point on when it gets rebuilt. So this is our proof that what they found in the temple was a book of Deuteronomy. Now, which draft, we don't know. But the point is, this is a really a critical piece of evidence about what was going on. And it's evident that when they find this scroll and they proclaim it, it is now a sacred text. It is for them a sacred text that must be followed because it is the will of God. Yes, Dan? This happens in the, um, in the late uh, 7th century BCE. Okay? Like the 620s. Yeah. 
No, there was no temple in Alexandria. There was a temple in Egypt, but that's in uh, late second, uh, it's in second temple period. Um, it's a whole other thing. Yeah, yeah, no. There, after this, there was no sacrificing when they went to exile in Babylon. I mean, they just, but, you know, this put, you know, put the stamp on, this is the way it's got to be. Okay. All right. Um, so, what are the arguments for the documentary hypothesis? What is the proof of these? And I've given you seven arguments from Richard Elliott Friedman, who wrote a wonderful book called Who Wrote the Bible? He also wrote, uh, uh, translated the Torah and put all of the four sources in different type, uh, different font and color. Um, now, again, not everybody agrees with every single one. This is E, this is a J. But the point is, it's a really neat thing to look at because then you can look through the Torah and you can actually see. And he has some notes there as well. So in his introduction to this Torah translation, he reiterates the arguments he made in his book, Who Wrote the Bible, um, as seven arguments for the, the, the overall truth of the documentary hypothesis. Number one is linguistic. Hebrew has a history, and there are, there are parts of the Hebrew Bible, in, or parts of the Torah especially, that are, can be seen to be older than others by virtue of the nature of the language itself. So that the oldest part of the whole Hebrew Bible, very likely, and certainly the oldest part of the Torah, is chapter 15 of the book of Exodus, the Song of the Sea. The language is very early Hebrew, dating to the 11th or 10th century BCE. It's very archaic. It has forms there that you don't find else, you know, rarely elsewhere. And when you look at some of the poetry in the Bible, you're going to find, you know, some of it's later, obviously, you're going to find that it's written in an archaic Hebrew. On the other side of the coin, if you look at the Hebrew in the book of Esther, it's late Hebrew. It's very close to the Hebrew of the Mishnah. Of the, that, you know, hundreds of years later with the rabbis. So people who are much smarter than I in this uh, can go through and can help to see that there are linguistic differences in positing the dates of certain documents, but you can also see linguistic differences between the four sources. That J tends to use a certain vocabulary that E uses a different vocabulary, and then P and D, you know, like for example, um, in, in P, the, temp, the, the tabernacle is called the Mishkan, all right? In D, it's called the Ohel Moed. In P and in E, and I guess J, the revelation takes place on Mount Sinai. In D, it takes place on Horeb, two names. Um, Moses' father-in-law has different names depending upon which source you look at, and so on and so on and so forth. There's different terminology for certain things that you can see a big difference between the earlier stuff and the later stuff. Okay, so that's number one. Yes? How, if at all, did some of our early scholars they accepted the rabbinic dogma that it was all given to Moses on Mount Sinai at one time. There was one scholar in the Middle Ages who he could, he has a couple of places where he says this text was obviously added later, and that was considered heretical. <laughs> Ibn Ezra in his commentary, has a couple of places. Okay. So, uh, linguistic uh, um, terminology is a separate one. Okay, he talks about the fact that in J and P, it's, um, okay, um, it's called Sinai, and in E and D, it's, it's called Horeb. All right, so there's all these, so that's two things. One is the linguistic, the nature of language self. Second is the terminology. Uh, number three, what he calls consistent content, okay, the tabernacle is mentioned more than 200 times in P, 
but is never mentioned in D or J and only three times in E. That's really interesting, isn't it? It shows you what the P people were interested in. Okay, if you take a look on the next page, the arc is mentioned in J as crucial to military success, like they would carry it into battle. It's never mentioned in E. All right? And the arc is barely mentioned in D. It's just a box. It's in P that you have the elaborate uh, description of it with gold and the griff, you know, the cherubim on top and all this kind of stuff. So that's what I, you know, the cherubim are mentioned in P and the Garden of Eden in, should be Garden of Eden in P, but they're not mentioned in E or D. So, so Meaning that in each document there is consistency, but not between documents. Okay. All right. Um, another big area is priestly leadership. In P, the only priests are the sons of Aaron, and they're the only ones who have access to God. There are no dreams, no angels, no talking animals. But all of these occur in J, E, and D. Okay? The words prophet and prophesy occur 13 times in E and D, but not in J or P. In P, Levites are not priests. In D, all Levites are priests. And that's why D is a superior text. <laughs> are you a Levite? <laughs> no. What very likely is, is this represents an actual historical struggle that took place in early Second Temple period. That in the First Temple period, all members of the tribe of Levi were priests, and they're the ones who um, officiated at all the local shrines. In the early Second Temple people, those that were descendants of Aaron grabbed control of the temple and relegated the Levites to non-sacrificial functions in the temple. That's, in a nutshell, sort of what probably happened. Yeah. Who did bar mitzvahs and weddings? No bar mitzvahs and weddings were, who knows? It wasn't the priests. No, they the did priests. not, but the priests were... Um, the preservers of the tradition, they were healers, and they were judges. They were very critical. They were the religious leadership. And then you had prophets, and you had scribes. Those were the three classic um, uh, religious leaders. The scribe were a lay, um, uh, a lay body of uh, literate people who mostly functioned as bureaucrats in the royal and provincial governments. The prophets were prophets, and there were all kinds of different kinds of prophets. Um, and the priests um, served at the shrines in the temple. Yes, Bird. The Levim obviously didn't have a strong union to, to <laughs> but, but, but the point is that if they were priests and then relegated to a yeah. separate role, there was no, not as we see in, uh, the Muslims with uh, the Shia and the Sunni that they, they've been battling ever since. The, the Levine just said, okay, well, what's that? Well, we don't that? know. <laughs> okay. uh, that, that's a whole interesting topic, but the, the Levites ended up being the temple guards um, uh, and a whole bunch, the choir, the band, and a bunch of other functions. Ushers. <laughs> the ushers. Ushers. Um, what? Do you remember the descendants of what? Yes, the, the high priesthood came down through the descendants of the high priest at the time of Solomon, who were in turn descendants of Aaron. There was a struggle in the days of David and Solomon between two uh, different priests as to who was the high priest, and um, Sadduk had threw his lot behind Solomon to become king, so the other guy was exiled. Yeah. And after, I mean, Pincus, that whole episode... Uh, I got the right guy who thrust his knee. Yeah, right. Yeah, he's the one that the line comes the down through. The was given to his descendants. Right. Well, it, any of the descendants of Aaron, he had four sons, two died, two survived. The priest, the high priesthood supposedly came down through his, the surviving oh, sons. Right. I mean, you can actually trace 
um, the line of the high priests in the Second Temple period uh, pretty far back. I mean, we know the names of most of them. Right? Who's, uh, I'm sorry, Robert. Who's Richard L. Freeman? He is a Bible scholar, a really good Bible scholar who's written a lot of... Uh, uh, in, yeah, oh yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And he writes for the general reader as well. Well, he's written some not, books that are not about biblical stuff, but he's he, he wrote a really good book called The, um, uh, the Disappearance of God, which is a great piece of theology. Okay, um, so number four is continuity of texts, meaning narrative flow. So, for example, there are two flood stories. One is P and one is J in Genesis 6 to 9. And you could pry them apart and you'd have two different stories. The basic stuff is the same, but there are details that are different. Okay? Um, when you take a look at the, the combined, and here they call it RJE, meaning it with the redaction, the final editing text, is a continuous narrative. Right? Wherever the flow is broken by a P text that was edited in to the JE text, it then picks up where it left off. Also, there is a continuous story in P. If you go through the P material in Genesis and the narrative parts of Exodus and the, P, the narrative parts of Numbers, it's, all, it's a whole story and it's very different in many ways than when you add in the, the J and E, and we're, I'm gonna show you that, okay? Um, and as I point out here is there is a division within P, which is what is called H and P. The earlier is P, and then there was a layer, second layer added, which the scholar Jacob Milgram called H, the holiness code. Okay, connections with other parts of the Bible. Jeremiah's language in many places sounds a lot like D. And Jeremiah, therefore, was probably part of the school of the, Deuter the Deuteronomic school before. In other words, the Deuteronomic school very likely came from a group of northern refugees from the destruction of the northern kingdom who moved into Judea and based on their experience created this reformation of the tradition. And Jeremiah happens to come from a town uh, where the refugees went, and so he very likely uh, was part of that school, even though they hadn't yet produced or they, you know, or the final edition. So there's also a lot of connections between the, the prophet Ezekiel and P. Okay? And when you look at the prophet Hosea, there's a lot of connections between Hosea and J and E. And when you look at the court history of 2 Samuel, meaning the story of David, you see some stories that were obviously written with stories in Genesis in mind. For example, the rape of uh, David's daughter Tamar by her half-brother seems to be a kind of parallel to the story of Tamar and Judah in the book of Genesis. Okay. So there, this is called intertextuality. Number six, relationship among the sources to each other and history. So J and E come from, J comes from Judah, E comes from Israel, but only in um, what you can see that in the J sources, the figure of Judah is an important figure. In the E tradition, it's Joseph that's the important figure not Judah. P is connected to the time of King Hezekiah, who lived in the uh, late uh, 8th, early 7th century BCE. And um, you begin to see from there the distinction, um, it's a little earlier than I said before, of the Levites and the priests in the time of Hezekiah. In other words, Hezekiah seems to be trying to enact a Deuteronomic re uh, revolution because during his time, the northern kingdom was destroyed. So some of those refugees, evidently, we, we actually know from archaeology that the city of Jerusalem in the time of Hezekiah expanded enormously to uh, obviously a huge population. And they must have this huge influx of refugees from the north because the city just expanded its boundaries. So Hezekiah was influenced by these northern reformers and he tried to enact 
some of the reforms of the early Deuteronomic school, but he didn't succeed fully. Okay, um, it's evident, as I pointed out, that D is connected with the story of Josiah, and it would seem J and E tend to be earlier than P, and you can sort of tell that. Okay, the last thing is what are called convergence. There are 30 cases of repetitions. Okay, the creation story, the genealogy from Adam, the flood story, Abraham's migration, the wife-sister story where Abraham says that Sarah is his sister. He does it twice, and then Isaac does it once. And the Abrahamic covenant is repeated several times in different sources. Okay? Anybody have any uh, comments at this particular point? Questions? All right? Okay, so here's an example of how you can parse the whole thing. And this was taken from Jeffrey Tigay's commentary in the Jewish Study Bible to the book of Exodus. So, um, here you're going to find the E, the J, and the P source, not D. Okay? This is Exodus chapter 24. So if you want to turn to that in your books, so you can keep an eye on the story as it is in our Tanakh, which doesn't make the distinctions. All right? So the story is about how Moses goes back up onto Mount Sinai and they have this, he goes with some uh, the elders and um, they have this revelation of God and um, it, it's, it's a very weird uh, story and it's filled with all kinds of inconsistencies. So, um, and you can break this story down into these three sources. All right, this is on page 164. So, here's Tigay's comment. In J, Moses is to be accompanied partway by the priest of el uh, priests and elders. In E, he apparently is accompanied partway by Joshua, but leaves the elders, Aaron and Hur, behind. While in P, he seems not to be accompanied by anybody. J does not tell of any law giving. To it, the event at Sinai was a visual encounter with God experiencing in different degrees by the people, the leaders, and Moses. In other words, you can go back and parse the whole Exodus event, and if you pull out all the JTEX, no laws are given. It's just a pyrotechnical um, display. Okay? And that the covenant is established by this meal, this meal with God that takes place in chapter 24. If you take out all the E-texts, it t it's primarily an auditory experience. The establishment of a covenant by a blood rite and the ratification of the book of the covenant. So the whole of the laws are E and Moses is sent to receive the tablets of the Decalogue. And the, so the Ten Commandments are embedded within the E account, although they're older actually, it's an older text. Um, they're embedded within the E text. So the E is auditory. Okay, to P, what happens at Sinai is Moses goes up into the mountain only to receive the instructions for constructing the tabernacle. That's chapters 25 to 31, in which God will dwell among the Israelite and give Moses laws. So for P, the laws don't start until the beginning of the book of Leviticus. All right? That's the three different versions of what's going on here. So here's chapter 24. Now remember... The italics are, is J, okay? The bold is um, E, and the P is in a uh, different font. So if you look at the chapter, look at what it looks like. Isn't that interesting? You should read each one separately. But that's what I've got for you. So turn over on page five. These are the three versions. Okay, so if you pull out all the E, and you can, you, you know, some of you can keep an eye on the text as it's in our Tanakh. Somebody want to read the E version, and Moses came. Moses came, Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the ordinances. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. He wrote 
rose early in the morning and built an altar in the foot of the mountain and set up 12 pillars corresponding to the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay, so then they do the blood rite, which is the ratification of the covenant, and then pick it up on verse 10. The Lord said to Moses, uh, verse 12, sorry. 12, yeah. The Lord says to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and wait there. I will give you the, ta the ta tablets of stone with the law and the commandments, which I have written for, the, for their instruction. So Moses set out with an assistant, Joshua, and Moses went up to the mountain of God. To the elders he has said, wait here for us until we come to you again, for Aaron and her are with you. Whoever has a dispute may go to them. Then Moses went up the mountain. Moses was in the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. No meal, no vision of God. It's all about the what he heard, the writing down of the commandments, the Decalogue. This is what happens after, after Mount Sinai and all the laws are given. Okay, so that's the e-text. All right, take a look at the J version of it. Somebody want to read that? Then he said to Moses, come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel and worship at a distance. Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but the others shall not come near, and the people shall not come up with him. Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel went up, and they saw the God of Israel. Under his feet there was something like a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven of clearness. God did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. Also they beheld God and they ate and drank. Notice Joshua's in the E version, he's not there. Aaron and Hur are not in the E version, but they're in the J version. The J version, they have this, vi it's all visual, right? No laws, nothing that they just, and they have a meal with God. That is, whereas in the E, it's the blood rite that sanctifies the covenant. In J, it's having a, having a, a covenantal meal with God. Okay, now the P version, I had to start, you have to start at the beginning of chapter 19 of Exodus in order to get the narrative correct. Somebody like to begin reading it. At the third new moon, after the Israelites had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that very day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They had journeyed from Rephidim, entered the wilderness of Sinai, and camped in the wilderness. Israel camped there in front of the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. Okay, stop there. So that's the beginning of chapter 19 of Exodus. And then the P-text stops, and you go all the way to chapter 24, verse 16, and that's where it picks up. So everything, all the rest of it was edited together there, okay? So now pick it up. This is chapter 24, verse 16, the glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on top of the mountain for the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. And what happens in chapter 25? That's what Moses gets. He gets the instructions for building the tabernacle, which takes up almost the rest of the entire book of Exodus, except for the golden calf story, which is not P. So the only... Moses gets no laws. All he does is get he gets the, the architectural plans uh, for the tabernacle, and it's only the beginning of Leviticus that God speaks not from Mount Sinai, but out of the tabernacle and gives the laws that are found in Leviticus. So there you go. Okay? So you see how different these stories are. If you take a look on page 6, I've given you, for example... We're going to talk about P now. Anybody have any questions at this point? Everybody got it? Okay. So, I'm, we're going to talk about P now. So, the priestly school, here are all the P texts found in the Torah. Okay? So, you've got the creation story, that's chapter 1. You've got the flood story. You've got genealogy. You've got Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Then you have... You know, the Exodus, but you don't, you got plagues. 
But you don't have, uh, again, the Mount Sinai is chapter 19, and whoop, we're over to chapter 24. The laws of the tabernacle, the setting up of the tabernacle. The entire book of uh, Leviticus is P, with a few, uh, again, probably a, a later uh, level in there called H. In the book of Numbers, you've got a whole bunch of the book of Numbers is P, although not all of it. And what happens is, is that the P editor is added at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, the death of Moses. Okay? Now, if you were to go through all these texts and just read it, skipping to the next one, well, one of the things you will not find in here is the Akedah, for example, the Biden of Isaac. It's not there. Okay? That's an e-text. So you can read, you know, it, it's like totally reading a totally different Torah on some level. So what do we know about the P text, P, from based on all of this? Well, one of the main things is, is that the P people were kind of reformers in themselves. And they, you find in the P material a polemic against paganism, and a belief in demons. The P people did not like the idea that Israelites believed in demons. They cut all that out. Okay? And so that was something that's part of their ideology. There is no magic. There are no demons. Because that would qualify the power of God. They're pretty strict monotheists, the P people. They're very interested in the pollution of the sanctuary and the purification of the sanctuary. That's where we get Yom Kippur from, is from the P people. In fact, our holiday calendar pretty much comes from P. Okay? They're, so they have a non-demonic conception of purity, meaning some of a lot of the rituals that you find in P, like the, the rituals of the leper, and various, originally were anti-demonic -dem rituals to get rid of demons. They reformed them and turned them into monotheistic rituals that had nothing to do with demons because the people didn't want to give those things up. So they didn't get rid of the ritual. They just transformed why it, what it was for. All right. They were obviously very interested in the cult, of the sacrificial cult. That was like, that's the key element of P. And they... They, they, they brought about this gradual revolution in practice um, in the shrines and temples of ancient Israel. And they also had certain, they, their, their whole symbolic system, this is where it says D here, life versus death. What at the heart of what they believed is the notion that God represents life and there's a constant struggle of life over death. And therefore, death itself becomes the, becomes the, uh, the source of pollution and impurity. Okay? Um, so they're the ones who have the universal blood prohibition that we still follow in our laws of Kashrut. And between, in the, internally within P, there is a distinction between P and H. H is the, what's called the holiness code. And in P, the concept of kedusha, holiness, tends to be static. It's sensing this is the way it is, and that's the way it's always going to be. In H, it seems that holiness is dynamic. It can change, and it can grow and do other things. Yes? So the red pepper be in P? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it is. Okay. Um... In P, the violation of holiness can only occur in the sanctuary itself. In H, it can happen within the entire covenant people. So H has been extremely influential on the development of the Jewish notion of what is holy. And its dynamic notion and the idea that it's not confined just to the sanctuary is sort of the ideological underpinnings of what later becomes the decentralization of Jewish practice in the synagogue and in the home. That you can, the home has to be a center of holiness, the sanctuary, the, the synagogue has to be, a, you know, that it spreads out. Okay? Um, they, of course, have uh, the theology of sacrifice. What is sacrifice about? For them, it is 
You know, we have a lot of trouble with sacrifice because we just are so far away from it, we just don't understand it. But for them, it was a very critical spiritual element. It was the form of worship. We're not even sure that anything was said during the sacrificial service. There's nowhere in the Torah when the rules of sacrifice are given in Leviticus does it say the priests have to say anything. So it could have been done in complete silence. It's the act itself that is the worship. Um, and um, when you look at Leviticus 19, which is the P version of the Ten Commandments, by the way, it's all about ethics. It's like this, you know, P tends to be sort of criticized as these, you know, priests who are doing all these rituals for the sake of ritual. No, everything they did had an ethical basis to it. They didn't make a distinction what we would between ethical practice and ritual practice. For them, they were all combined. Right? Um, according to Milgram, he doesn't believe that the P material is later than 750 BCE. He finds in it some echoes of what was going on at that time in, in Israelite and Judean culture and politics. Very likely that the P people originally came from Shiloh, the temple at Shiloh that existed. That's where the Ark was put after they came from the desert. It was in Shiloh. Um, and only later when the Shiloh, the Shiloh temple is destroyed by the Philistines, and David, of course, moves the Ark into Jerusalem, and then Solomon builds the temple. So very likely P comes from the Shiloh priests and then from the Jerusalem priests priesthood. And where was Shiloh? Shiloh is uh, kind of northeast, I think, of Jerusalem. Um, what they have found there, they have found the remains of an extensive Israelite ritual compound. The problem is where the temple itself stood, uh, the Byzantines built a church. And so the ruins, the, which is now ruined, but they cleared out any evidence for what the actual Shiloh temple looked like. So we don't have the ruins of the temple itself, but we have an extensive... Um, a ritual compound around what would have been the temple in Shiloh. Okay, and that's where Samuel, for example, you know, gets his calling is in the Shiloh temple, and it's referred to as a temple, not a tabernacle. Okay, um, Milgram believes that H comes from the time of Hezekiah, which is later than 750 BCE, um, at the end of the 8th century BCE, probably from the later Jerusalem temple and. Very likely there was a final edit of the P material in post-exilic times when the whole Torah was being edited together. The P people ended up producing the Torah. Okay? And they're the ones who really ended up producing it. Okay. You got more, a little more time? Or you want to stop here? We'll stop here and then next week we'll go on and we'll bring this.